Hello, everybody, and welcome to the New Flame Sports Podcast. It's your host, Andrew, <clears throat> with a special MLB-only episode of the podcast today. We're going to cover some topics like Miguel Cabrera's 500th home run, the Yankees, Braves, and Dodgers all having nine-game winning streaks, the Little League Classic tonight between the Angels and Indians, uh, what's happening with San Diego, uh, just the fact that they have been, been playing really bad the past like two or so weeks, and also some little little bit of some updated MLB predictions. You know, a lot has happened over the course of the season. Some big injuries like Mike Trout. Um, so, you know, just an update on that and see how I was doing. Before we head into the actual, you know, uh, things, topics to cover, we have a question of the day. This was actually brought to me by my dad. He said, if you and I, the same player have the same batting average with one game left, you both the teams have already clinched your division, or do you play? And, you know, there are a couple of scenarios here. So, say me and Kareem are both batting 350 on the season, and even 350, okay? And, you know, this, and, you know there are a couple of scenarios. Maybe, you know, your game, you find out that, the other that could that say I found out that Kareem wasn't playing, and so does that make me want to play? Because then you have to think about it. Because what if my average was like three fifty three five zero two, and then his was three five zero seven? So would that incentivize me to play? And maybe go I go one through four, and boom, he won. He wins by like a whole point. Or if I had the higher batting average by point zero 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 five points, do I not play? And then say the other person does, and then plays, and then say I learn that Kareem does play. Would that? Would I just hope that he goes one for four? Or do, would I also want to play? You know, in order to win the batting title. Um, so just something to think about. And personally, what I would do is. I would see if if Kareem would play or not, and say he does. Let's say he goes two for four, okay? He bats 500. His, and say now, just very arbitrarily, he had, he, he finished the season, like, like with a 350, a 350, like, three, 353 average, okay? And then, and then I was like, mm, with a 350, I was like, and then I was like gonna be like, hey, in the sixth or fifth inning, be like, hey, put me in so I can get two at bats, and then try to go two for two, which would you know like, wait, wait. I think if you went two for four, I think your average would only be like three fifty two, so, and then I would be go two for two, hopefully, or even one for two, and you know boost my average up, you know either the same or slightly more than his. So I think it would all depend on. If he does, and if he doesn't play, then I would, you know, just be like, hey, put me in for one at bat. Just give me one chance, you know, to get the batting title if I wasn't already winning by point zero zero five. So, like I said, just some, something to think about. Let me know in the comments below what you would do and uh, into the news. But starting with the biggest topic of them all, Miguel Cabrera today on August 22nd, I forgot what the date was, of 2021, it's its 500th career home run, all the way back in 2003 when he was playing left field with the Marlins, um, you know, his first career home run was a walk-off, and then this, his latest, his 500th, um, was a home run against the Blue Jays, and uh, I thought it was just really neat, I read an article, it was like, Miguel Cabrera, like, when, doing that, his first home run, he, he was, he, he was like, um, like, back when he was playing left field, he was like, oh, Miggy, what were you doing? And, uh, you know, that, that was, I mean, that's fun. You know, you always like to hear stories, like, about, like, the older veteran players, like, reflecting on their past. I mean, it's pretty fun to hear stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, Miguel Cabrera, like, I tried to post the, uh, clip of his 500th home run, but it got copyright claimed by MLB, and they took the video down. So I just took the video down. So if you saw, if you're one of the like the four people who saw it, good on you. But um, you know, if not, that's okay. Um, but yeah, Miguel Cabrera. After after how many years has it been? 18 years uh, in the major leagues. Uh, he finally hits his 500th home run. He's been stuck on um 4.99 for about like almost a month now. 
um, but was finally will was finally able to do it. He's always been willing to do it, but you know, you know, you know, it's just Miguel Cabrera is obviously going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer from back in his 2003 days with the Marlins playing left field. Then he got to the Tigers, started playing a little bit of third base. Then he went over to first base, had the triple crown season. And now in the past, you know, three, four years has just not been the same that he was during, you know, 2010 to 2013. Really, I think those were his best three years. Um, I mean, obviously 2012 was his best year winning triple crown, getting triple crown and winning MVP that year. But, you know, 18 years later, he's finally gotten up to 500 career home runs, which is a feat that only 20 of 27 other guys can say. So, I'm sure he is gonna go tonight sleeping pretty well. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he will be just gonna be so amped up by this, he won't be able to sleep. I mean, that's like something interesting that you know I thought that you know you would think about. So, um, congratulations to Miguel Cabrera on his 500th home run uh, today. So, moving on. We got some of the hottest teams in baseball, the Yankees, Braves, and Dodgers all winning nine in a row now. Um, the Yankees, I think, have been the hottest team in baseball over the past month since, really, since the start of July. Um, uh, and I really think that this one series just changed our entire season. I think it was the series before we played Houston, the Mets series. That is what so it was two series before we played Houston, but when we played the New York Mets and Chapman, you know, this was in the middle of Chapman's struggles, and um, and we had the doubleheader on July fourth against the Mets. We lost the first game ten to five. Then the second game, Nestor Cortez and um, Chad Green, they just flipped the switch on our season. At that point, we were third in the division by a wild Boston and Tampa who neck and neck for first place, and the Yankees were kind of being taken as a joke. And then that second game, Nessu Cortez and Chad Green, like I said, combined for seven innings in the no doubleheader. We win 4-2. to two. Then we go on to win a series against Seattle, against Houston. Uh, you know, we two, we beat the Phillies in Phillies two games. Um, we played Tampa those two games. And even though, like, we still lost that third game to Tampa 14-0. I mean, we don't talk about that, but... Still, that was the turning point, was the Mets game, because after that, we've had the best record since then, I believe. Um, if not, it's pretty close to it. And the and the additions at the trade deadline during the Miami Marlins series of Gallo and Rizzo and even Joely Rodriguez, who's been pretty solid for us coming over from Texas in the Gallo deal, has only given up like two runs in seven games, and, and he's another guy that can go two innings for us, so... I mean, ever since that Mets doubleheader on July 4th, the Yankees have been the best team in baseball. And to me, it's not really been close. Tyone, James Tyone, has also just absolutely turned his season around, all thanks to his curveball. He was never really able to put hitters away uh, before that, before July. And then, boom, his something clicked with his curveball, and all of a sudden, he had a uh, put-out pitch. And ever since, I mean, he hasn't looked back. One pitcher of the month in July had a really st strong start to August's first two starts. Last two starts have, starts have been a little shaky for him, but, you know, it is what it is. But And then also you have Nestor Cortez stepping up. You have, um, you, I mean, like, there have just been so many guys that have been stepping up for us. Luis Heal, who we've called on in three games against the Mariners, Oils, and... Red Sox, Red Sox, that's what it was. But, um, Luis Heal, Lucas Litge, Wandy Peralta, um, Steven Ridings, and Brody Conio from the Miners have been good pieces for us. And, <clears throat> yeah, we lost the Field of Dreams game. I don't want to talk about it. Like, well, like, just quick side right here. I was watching that game. And, you know, it was really nice. Kevin Cosner came out, led the teams out of the cornfield. And, um, and, uh, the Yankees were losing 5-2. to two, And I was like, man, like, I, like, you know, I thought we were going to lose that game. And then, and then I went to, you know, to, uh, my room to do some homework. Because, yes, we started school this early. And, uh, on August 12th, we started a week before that. But, you know, but we, 
we were down by four runs or whatever it was in the ninth inning, and Liam Hendricks came in the game. I was like, oh, we're done for. And um, boom, I see a notification pop on my phone. Jaron, Aaron Judge hits two on homer, uh, home run. Yankees show the White Sox eight to whatever, or seven to six or whatever it was. And then about five minutes later, I see John Carlos Stan hits two on home run. Yankees take lead over the White Sox eight to seven. And I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> like that was my actual reaction. I was like, um, okay. I mean, like I was like confused. And then I go out to watch the game with my dad. And, uh, Zach Britton comes in the game. I'm like, uh, what are we doing? Jonathan Loisega is perfectly well rested. It's three straight righties. Zach Britton's been bad this year. And we went to Zach Britton. We, we all know what happened from there. I don't want to talk about it. But, yeah, we played the White Sox. And we played the Angels. The two, uh, game, uh, make up from before. And then Boston, we, we swept them. Minnesota, we swept them. Game got postponed today. But, and, and you know... I think that just the fact that our pitching has been so good, so good, we've gotten good contributions from guys like Andrew Velasquez coming out of nowhere, being just decent all of a sudden. Luke Voigt's come back from injury and been really good. Not in his 2020 form, but he's been all out, he's been really good. And and then Rugnet Odor has been all, all right. He's been struggling the past couple of weeks, though. But... It's just solid win after solid win after solid win for the New York Yankees right now. And if they can keep this going, I don't see any reason why they won't be able to catch Tampa Bay. And what's the nice thing about it is that on October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, we play Tampa Bay in a three-game series. So if we're within three games of them, we have a chance of catching them and winning our division, which would be absolutely huge. And you look ahead at our schedule, we have... uh. We've got Atlanta for two, Oakland for four, Angels for three, Baltimore, Toronto, Mets, make up for Minnesota, Baltimore, Cleveland, Texas, Boston, Toronto, Tampa. All of these series are winnable. I see the hardest team on this schedule is the Boston Red Sox, who we play three more times. But we have the Orioles, we have the Rangers, the Twins are another game, the the Indians or the Guardians or whatever you want to call them now, the Cleveland baseball team. But, you know, I, I feel really confident in this team that we're going to be able to go out and get another win after, you know, every day. But we play the, the Atlanta Braves next, who are, again, one of the hotter teams in baseball, winning nine in a row. Yes, they just played Baltimore for three games, but, you know, you know, it is what it is. Um... And they played Miami and Washington. Okay, so maybe their nine-game winning streak isn't as impressive as I first thought. But the fact that they were able to go from third place to first place in a matter of two weeks, is, when they were down by four, five, six games, is incredible. I mean, the Mets have been faltering. The Phillies have. I mean, they've been playing slightly above 500 baseball, but. The Braves have really stepped it up. Tuki Tucson has come back from injury and been amazing. Uh, they've gotten great production from Jorge Soler and other guys that they got at the deadline, like Adam Duvall coming back. Like, if the Braves don't, like, re-sign him, like, I don't understand it because he's been amazing for the Braves and just has struggled everywhere else. But, like I said, Tuki Tucson, Max Freed has been really good. Charlie Morton has been all right. And then... You have guys like Soleo, Duvall, Jock Peterson that they got at the deadline. And you look at that team like, yes, you don't have Ronald Cunha Jr. every day in center field or in right field batting first. But you can combine Adam Duvall, Jock Peterson, Jorge Soleo, and then Eddie Rosario once he comes back. And you have, a, you have, the, you have what you had in Acuna minus the speed, essentially. So I really like what the Braves are doing. Uh, right now, and then just a week later after they play the Yankees, they play, or after they play the Giants and then the Dodgers, so a big five-game set for them there, playing San Francisco and then the Dodgers, or six games, I'm sorry, um, but like, if they can win, if they can find a way to win four out of those six games, I think the Braves are going to be able to be taken seriously, because I feel like right now, the Braves are kind, they're kind of being like, 
you're kind of being taken like, oh, well, the Mets have been bad, and, and you know, the Phillies have been bad recently. Uh, so, you know, and it's the fact that they had an easy schedule recently is the fact that um, that they were in first place. But if they can go out and beat the Giants and beat the Dodgers, when four out of those six games, I feel like they, they will be able to be taken seriously. Because I feel like, along with the Yankees, people only remember that that sluggish start that they had and aren't looking at what they're doing right now and taking them seriously because i feel like it's not going to be until the yankees like are able to find a way to take to come within one game of tampa for, for for first place until we can be taken seriously but i mean yeah like i said uh braves thanks to some weaker scheduling and the other teams in the division not playing well, have been able to take first place. Moving on to the Dodgers, who have also won nine in a row. Um, I mean, I mean, we all knew that the Dodgers were going to be good this season, but and then the fact that they added, you know, Max Scherzer and Trey Turner at the trade deadline only gets scarier. And then, they, and then the fact that David Price has come back and been, like, good, for some reason, Cody Bellinger has been playing better in the past two, like little little bit. He was god awful to start the season. Uh, actually, no, he's not playing better. I thought he was. Never mind. So disregard everything I just said about Cody Bellinger. He's been playing bad the entire season. But he, but like still, even if you think about the fact that 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 Cody Bellinger is having a down year and the Dodgers are still. What, the Dodgers still have 78 wins? Two and a half, two and a half games back out of first place? You look at that, and you're like, wow, that team is has good management, good pitching, good depth um, in the field. And that's what the Dodgers are. You look at that team, they have Corey Seager, Trey Turner, Max Muncy, Justin Turner. That is a team that is, that is an infield full of possible all-star game starters right there. Corey Seager might be leaving in free agency, but then you just have Trey Turner plug in at shortstop for next year, because I think that's why they got him. They were just going to let Corey Seager go free agency and keep the younger Trey Turner for some speed on that team. And then you have Gavin Lux, who, before they got Turner, uh, was actually playing pretty like decently, better than he has in the past. So, I mean, for a former like, top prospect, I think they'll, they'll be really excited if he can you know start get something going here but and then also Mookie Betts is hurt and he's been hurt for most of this season so you look at that and you're just like wow you imagine if this team was fully healthy and everyone was playing to their full potential looking at you Cody Bellinger but I just I, I just find this amazing that the Dodgers are able to take what was already a championship level team we saw it last year and just make it better even though they're not getting a performance out of Cody Bellinger. I mean, I mean, looking at it today, I feel like this just the city of Los Angeles has been, you know, pretty hype, pretty hype right now. You know, you got Russell Westbrook uh, a couple weeks ago in the NBA draft uh, and trade with the Wizards, the Rams. You know, every everyone thinks that they're gonna have a legitimate quarterback now with Stafford. The Chargers have a bright future. The Dodgers. You know, one of the best teams in baseball, and then in and then with the Angels, you have one of the best players in baseball, if not the best player in baseball right now, at least this season, Shohei Otani. So, I mean, good things are happening out in LA. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll be able to catch the Giants in a late season uh, series. Like, let's see, what who do they play? Yeah, they play San Francisco through three games, September third through the fifth, and then that's it. Oh man, that's tough. That'll be interesting. But on the bright side, they do have a weak schedule. Look, they got San Diego, who's not playing well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. They got Colorado, Atlanta, San Francisco, St. Louis, San Diego again. But then this is where it gets really easy. Arizona, Cincinnati, Colorado, Arizona. That out, you take out Cincy, and you have Arizona, Colorado, Arizona. For nine games, that's a possibility to seal the deal with the Giants, who, like, let's take a look at their upcoming schedule. And I hate to, you know, like, keep going about this, but, um, you know, it's it's got to be said, you know. Uh, but let's look at the Giants' schedule. 
You have the Mets will be a tough series. You got then you got the Brewers, which will be a tough series. But then you got Colorado, Chicago Cubs. Uh, and then you got the Padres who have been playing bad. I mean, looking at the Giants' schedule, not the easiest. Yes, you do have six more games against or nine more games, twelve more games. I'm sorry, twelve more games against Colorado, uh, Colorado, Arizona, and Chicago Cubs. But still, I don't know what the with the ease of the uh, the Dodgers schedule and then the not so easy Do Giants schedule, I don't know with the with the Giants only being up by two and a half games if they'll be able to hold that lead. But um, you know, I do feel confident that the, that the Giants will get it done. I really like that team. I like I like Buster Posey. I like Evan Longoria. I like Brandon Crawford, Donovan Solano, um, Tommy Lasella. I I love Tommy Lasella. <laughs> like when he was on the Cubs and Angels, like. Especially the past couple of years with the Angels, where he's been good. I mean, like I, I don't know what it is. I just really like Tommy Lastella. But and they and the Giants are getting pinch hit home runs from Lamont Wade Jr. Like whoever thought Lamont Wade would be good? Like no, I never heard of that dude before. Like two sec, two weeks ago, Logan Webb, Anthony Descalfani, Jake McGee has turned his career around in San Francisco. Um, so, and then you go out and get Chris Bryant at the deadline, so, I mean, the Giants are really capable of doing it all, and I don't know if the Dodgers are going to be able to catch them. But, uh, moving on to another NL West team, we got the San Diego Padres, who are currently 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. They've fallen 13 games out of first place in the NL wildcard spot. Or NL West, and for a team that everyone thought was going to make the playoffs, you know, you had Machado, you had Hosmer, you had Tatis, you had Will Myers, Trent Grisham, Austin Nola, um, who else they got? I, I don't know. And then on the pitching, you got, you have Blake Snell, a former Cy Young winner, you got you Darvish, a former Cy Young winner, you got, um, who, who else? Um, what's it? Chris Paddock, who people thought were going to be really good, and then now you're 13 games out of back out of first place, and you're one game back out of a wild card spot. Like, come on! Like, this can't be happening. Like, like San Diego has to step up their act. And like, let's look at their schedule over the past, you know, month or since the beginning of August, and let's find what their problem is. I, like, looking at it, they're giving up too many runs. I mean, like that's been their problem this entire year. You know, Blake Snell has not been good. Uh, Hugh Darvish was good to start the year. And then since the home run derby, and I meant to say also break, I mean, that's just the first thing that pops to mind. But they've been really bad. I mean, you look, you're allowing 12 runs and then 7 runs to Arizona. 6 runs, 8 runs to Arizona. You you can't have that. And then also their offense has not been hitting. Since August 1st, I'm going to read you the amount of runs they scored. One, one, four, five, two, zero, three, uh, I'm sorry, six, two, eight, six, zero, three, two, zero, eight, five, three, five, three, four, four. That is abysmal. I mean, yes, you had the games where you scored five, six, seven runs, but in a, in a game where your pitching is not living up to living up to standards, and then you have, you know, the these elite talent hitting, you expect to score eight, nine runs a game. And I feel like the Padres, this is exactly what happened to the Yankees at the beginning of the season. Nothing was clicking. Oh, you thought your offense was doing good today? You know, they've scored six runs? Well, your pitching's given up eight. Oh, your pitching is allowed only one run or two runs? Oh, good, because your offense has scored zero. Like, that was my, that was exactly what was happening with the Yankees early in the season. And, like, unfortunately for the Padres, it's happening at a very unfortunate time, right? You know, right with a month, month and a half left in the season where you cannot be faltering. Because you look at the Yankees, and I hate to keep bringing them up, but they, it took them until the, the all-star break to get good and, like, to start winning games and, you know, and the fact that they're going on this skid, you know, you know, in the beginning of August, not good. And and the fact that they were already like six games behind the 
um, pot, the the Dodgers and the Giants does not do them any favors. And now you look at Cincinnati, who has jumped them in the NL wild card spot, and if the season will end today, San Diego wouldn't be in the playoffs. And how do you expect to pay Fernando Tatis $341 million, Manny Machado $300 million, Eric Cosmo like $280 million, and then not make the playoffs and trade for two former Cy Young old winners? And then, yeah, I like I just don't understand it. Like, San Diego needs to figure this out immediately. Like, like they need to figure this out. And you look at their schedule... It does not do them any favors. You look at they got the Dodgers, Angels, Diamondbacks, Houston, Angels again, Dodgers, San Francisco, St. Louis, San Francisco, Atlanta, Dodgers, San Francisco to end out the year. From September 10th on, I don't know how many games they're going to win. And for the San Diego Padres, you need to win those games. You cannot go without those games and unfortunately you don't play the reds which is the team that you are behind and have the only shot at getting to to make a playoff spot because your last hope san diego right now is to make the second wild code spot in the nl and go on a magical run and by the looks of it that's not gonna happen <laughs> so i mean like Looking ahead, starting September 6th, well, what, yeah, September 10th, the San Diego Padres are in trouble. I'm going to go ahead and say that they're not going to make the playoffs this year. So, perfectly leading into our next section, to my next section, the updated MLB predictions. So, basically, what I'm going to be doing is, if the season ended oh, today, right now, this is what would happen. So... Let's look at the standings. In the American League, you have the winners seeded Tampa Bay number one, Houston number two, Chicago White Sox number three, and then you would have New York and Boston play in the wild card spot. Well, actually, Oakland and Boston have the same record, so let's just go off run differential in which Oakland is winning that. So, you would have the Yankees playing Oakland in New York. And in a one-game set, where you have Garrett Cole going up against Sean Manaya, most likely, because Chris Bassett got hit with a liner in the head and probably will not be coming back this, series, this season, I will take the Yankees in that series. Hate me all you want, call me biased, but I legitimately think that the Yankees, with the way they're playing right now, injuries included, like I said, Chris Bassett would not be starting this game. Gleyber Torres would not be playing this game. We would not have Corey Kluber, Domingo Herman, or anyone, um, or like half our pitching, um, right now in this in this game. So, with the way it sits right now, I take the Yankees to win this game over Oakland, meaning that they play Tampa Bay, and then the White Sox and Astros would play in a five-game series. Um, and I'll start with that series: White Sox, Houston. I, I mean. Houston would have home field advantage, and you look at that and you think, well, Rodon isn't available, Giolito hasn't been playing good this season, but then you look at the Astros, they were coming off a dominant series win against Seattle, and I think I would have to take Houston in this series, uh, putting them in the ALCS for, like, what, the fifth straight year spent going back to 20, um, 2017, four straight years, yeah. That would put them in the ALCS for four straight years. And then you have Tampa versus New York for a five-game series. And unless it went to four or five games, you would not have Garrett Cole. So if the Rays were to sweep us, that's unfortunate. But, unfortunate, but I mean, thankfully, I don't think the Rays would sweep us even uh, without Garrett Cole. But you look at the pitching matchups, and personally, I would go like Drew Montgomery versus, like, y Ryan Yarbrough game one, and Luis Heal would have to start a game, most likely, and, and Andrew Heaney would get bumped to the bullpen. Please, I swear, if he makes a starting rotation come playoff time, I will want to throw something. Um, But, unfortunately, I think I have to go Tampa. I feel like that team... Mm, wait, hold on a minute. They te their team just got a COVID infection. Um, 
Nelson Cruz got put on the COVID list, so that could be big. So, I mean, I don't really know if that's going to change my prediction. I think it would go the full five-game series, but I think Tampa would come out on top, you know, setting up a rematch for the last series ALCS, in which I think Tampa Bay wins it again. I don't think... Mm, wait, do I? Do I, though? Do I think Tampa... No. Mm, I don't know. I'll come back to it a little bit later. But heading over to the NL side of things. We got the Dodgers and the Reds in a one game set. It's obvious who would win this game. It would be the Los Angeles Dodgers. They are the, like, one of the, like, probably the second best team in all of baseball. And they would go on to play the Atlanta Braves in the NLDS. Alright, so, the Dodgers playing the Braves in the NLDS, and I just think that the Dodgers are just too good to be a wild card team. Like, they're gonna be looked at, like, a wild card team like they're bad. They're not. They're like the second best team in baseball, like I said. And I think even though Atlanta would have Max Freed, Tuki Tucson, and Charlie Morton go, I just think the fact that you have you would probably go Walker Bueller game one and then and then just I I just don't see how the Dodgers would lose to the Braves and as as the Braves being my second favorite team, I hate to say it. But I do think the Braves would put up a run for their money. I think it would go four games out of the possible five. And then the Giants versus the Brewers. That is a series for the ages. Ages. I just wish it was the NLCS. If there can be any possible way that the Giants and Brewers can play in the NLCS, please make it happen. Like I would love that series in a seven-game series. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That would be music to my ears right there. No, the ratings would be insane. Some of the best pitching in the league. But... Unfortunately, in a five-game series, you, you think game one. And keep in mind, since the playoffs start today, Freddy Peralta will not be available for this series for the Brewers. So, game one, you have Kevin Gosman versus Brandon Woodruff. And I think I think in game one, I think this is going to be my only like actual prediction game, I think the Giants would squeak out a win behind their ace, Kevin Gosman, and I think they would go out and win two out of their next three games, and also win the game, win the series in five games. Or four games, like, sorry, four games over the Brewers. And moving on, we have an NL West NLCS between the Giants and the Dodgers, and personally, with, with that and the fact that you know, the Giants or the Dodgers don't have Kershaw. I really think the Giants would be able to win this series. Just due to the fact that it would be a couple days. Kevin Gosman would be back available for Game 1. So would Waku Bulu. And, yeah, we had this matchup before the season. And the Giants, I think, got crushed. But still, I, like, I'm talking about Gosman versus Bulu. But, um, but I still think that the Giants would find a way to somehow... Some way win this series, and whether it's in four, five, six, seven games, I think personally it would be in six games, and I think the Giants would be representing the NL in the World Series. Yes, I know it's boring to just predict the one seed, but yeah, going back to the NL or AL, I'm sorry, do I want to be boring and pick the Rays? I or do I want to like not be a fan of my prediction and say the Astros? I, I think the fact that the Astros pitching right now is not in the best of shape, I think they're kind of thinking that hopefully, just maybe, that they're playing that, um, you know, um, Justin Verlander can come back for the playoffs. But since they won't have him for this hypothetical situation, I think the Rays would go back to back, win back to back ALCSs over the Astros, and in a, and setting up the World Series being the Giants and the Rays. And I think this this what this uh the answer to this is obvious. I think the Giants um are gonna be able to win this this series, and I I think they would do it in five games. I just think that the Rays hitting without Nelson Cruz won't be able to withstand the Giants pitching um and I don't think that the and I don't think the Rays pitching outside of like Ryan Yarbrough will be able to withstand the Giants hitting with Bossy Posey, Brandon Crawford, um Donovan Solano, Tommy Lostella and you know other guys like that they that they're just getting to just produce out of nowhere so you know I'm really excited for this for this MLB season to you know you know get into the 
dog day. I mean, we're already in the dog days of summer, but, you know, really, if your teams are still grinding, you look at a team, like, from the outside looking in, you look at Seattle, you look at Toronto, who are both within five games, and then you go over, you look at Philly, you look at St. Louis, and you look at San Diego, who are all also within five games, and, um, for their respective uh, AL and NL wildcard spots. So, I, this is going to be a really, really interesting end to the season. And, I mean, coming off last year where, you know, just baseball wasn't fun last year uh, as a fan. And I'm sure as a player, just was not fun. Um, and the fact that this year, teams are having fun. Players weekend is coming back this week. Uh, this weekend, this upcoming weekend, the jerseys haven't come out yet, which is kind of disappointing. I thought that they would have by now, but, um, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, speaking of players weekend, let's, the Indians are currently winning 3 nothing in the Little League World Classic. Uh, top seven, who's got the RBIs for the Indians? Miles Straw has one, and Ahmed Rosario has two. Did Ahmed Rosario hit a home run, maybe? Let's see how they've scored. See, Miles Straw ground, uh, RBI ground out for Miles Straw, and a Meadows RO2 on Homer. So, I think Cleveland will be able to hold on to this win, be able to win 3 0. Uh, I mean, at least 3 0. But, um, yeah, that'll do it for the, um, for this episode of the New Flame Sports Podcast. Stay tuned either later today or tomorrow for the NFL episode. I'm breaking them up just so they won't be like an hour and ten minutes long. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you there.